Hello, I'm Mary Casement and welcome to Gardening by the Bay. Today we're at Gore Farm, a fabulous multi-acre farm owned and operated by Peter and Nora Healis. Well, folks, here we are back at Gore Farm with Peter Helis, and as we were talking uh, at one of our earlier shows, we were inside his larger greenhouse. Now we're outside at what Peter refers to as Nora's kitchen garden. So tell us what's going on here, because this is, we're in the first week of May, folks, and look at all the wonderful things growing already. The, the kitchen garden is, is very useful, because we talked before when we were just having a little conversation about just growing intensively in small beds. But this is good because, you know, it's not that far realistically to where we grow in the big garden. But if you're just coming out for a meal and, and Nora's making a meal, she doesn't want to walk all the way down to the big garden to get a cucumber or get some dill or okay. get... So mainly this would be filled with lettuces because it's in the shade, as you can see uh, this morning. Yeah. It's in the shade, uh, and you want to grow some of those things in the shade, like lettuce, cucumbers, are shade-loving plants. Oh. So if you try to grow them in the direct sun in the middle of the uh, hot, summer. hot summer, they'll turn bitter. So what happens is that's why this garden is great in terms of because it, it has early morning shade and then late afternoon shade, gets sun during the day. But Nora can produce huge amounts out of this little garden. And it's 16 feet by four feet. So wow. it's not, uh, you know, it's not a giant place. No. And you can see I've just put compost on the top of it. Uh, that's fresh compost. It's not fresh compost, but it's five years old. Okay. So it's fresh compost to the bed. And every year we top up the bed with compost. All right. And then Nora has started, as you see, some of those plants, and some of them are perennials, and they're stuck in the corner there. They will come back as the as it warms up a little bit more. Okay. Mm -hmm. And has she started these from seed? Yeah, sta or started those in the uh, greenhouse, greenhouse that we were in from as seed. seed. Okay. And then uh, uh, pop them out here. All right. And they will. Uh, that, you, know, you can see now. Uh, Somebody said, well, how can you get them outside this time of year? Well, you can see the leaf of the um, kale is whitened. Oh, okay. Yes, right? That there. one's whitened. That's yep. frost. Okay. That got hit, right? you know, but yep. that's how tough it is. You know how cold it's been yes. in the first part of end of April, first part of May. But that's how tough the lettuces are unbelievably tough. You can't basically kill a lettuce with frost. It's that, they're that tough. So you can plant lettuce out anytime you want. Uh, but you've just told me something I didn't know is plant my lettuce in the shadier spot because I have fried lettuce frequently. Oh, and not only that on doesn't taste good, it gets bitter. No. Yeah. yeah. No, you want to be out in the cool and shady area for those type of things. She can eat, even if we stick uh, like a, a um, tomato, you know, one of the small tomato plants. Yeah, uh, like a little cherry tomato. Cherry tomato type. Okay. She'll put one of those in, but that's just for grandkids and stuff. And it will grow here and produce, but it's not the ideal spot because it wants the heat. And she'll stick it at the end of the thing where it gets mostly uh, mostly sun. Okay. And that's, you can pop a few if we're making a salad. So she, we call it a salad garden or we call it a kitchen garden because most of the things here we wouldn't keep over. It, she would harvest it all through the season. And, and just keep eating just every keep day eating from it. it. So thank you. I've learned something about lettuce, uh, which I didn't know before. It might prevent me doing it again. Um, this, so this little kitchen garden bed, uh, when do you then wrap it up for the, for the winter? Uh, we'll grow right till the frost kills everything out of it. So, and even then, like, in, our frosts are getting milder yes. and later in the in the fall, not in the spring, in, in the fall. So this one can sometimes go, she'll still harvest things out of here in November. Wow. You know, because fabulous. like um, so sage is so, and cilantro, those things are all so tough. And we, she continually uh, succession plants. So cilantro, as you know, you eat it fresh and then it's not very much use to you. It just goes to seed after that. So like she'll plant cilantro all through the season. Okay, and your lettuces and spinach and Same things. Same way, so you, you keep adding. Keep, so you can have fresh salad material That's the all idea, because what's the, you know, you put out 50 lettuce plants, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get into that problem. You need two or three lettuce plants for a week, right? Yeah. Or four or five at the most. And so, so do you suggest planting every two weeks or three weeks? Every what's two the weeks for every lettuce. Every two weeks, okay. And then we'll, we do about every uh, five weeks for 
the brassicas. Okay. So cabbage and collard. Now we don't grow different cabbages. So cabbages would be grown uh, summer cabbage and then fall cabbages and then winter storage cabbage. And so we make sauerkraut too. So we have those okay. for later on in the season, which we harvest it in the end of October. Excellent. And they're all, all in, started she, in your... Some of them are started. Some okay. of the winter cabbages still aren't started. So she'll start those in another two weeks. Okay. Excellent. Well, we've learned a lot. Well, Let's we'll go down to the big uh, garden and we'll, uh, we'll talk. Learn even more. Well, we won't learn much. We'll, we'll talk more I about that. I will. Okay. We're down at what we call the main gardens, right? Okay. We understand that most gardeners haven't got this kind of space, right? That you're talking in, for most gardeners in, in the bay, they've got small house gardens or kitchen gardens or they've got just a garden in their backyard. Or an eight by 10 community plots. Yeah, or community plot, which are wonderful to have and yeah. we encourage them all. But what we're lucky enough is we have like a, a lot of acreage here. <laughs> and so what we're going to try to just pan to is if we can, is that way over, I don't know if you can catch way over, but way over there's four garden plots. And the garlic this year is in plot number four. So that's how I mentioned when we were up in the greenhouse, oh, yes. we rotate it. Okay. So that gar garlic that was grown there this year yes. was grown in this garlic, in this plot last year. Last year, year. okay. And, and then we, we sow um, what we call um, cover crops for the most part, but w uh, over the, in that soil. Now in that soil I mixed last fall, I grew oats, Yes. And that's winter wheat now. So what you see coming okay. up is green now is winter wheat. Mm -hmm. And I've got a few other little things in there just to help encourage uh, some things that I'm trying to correct. Uh, I might have a little mustard seed or some other things that I, if I got a little disease problem. So you're trying to correct the soil. You're right. Now right in front of us is the what we call the dream house. We've been referring to it as the greenhouse, but it's we call it the dream house just simply because we didn't want to confuse it. So everybody in the house on the farm knows it as the dream house. Okay. And that dream house is portable. So as you can see, uh, those yeah. it, I pull that <clears throat> up to this space. Okay. So when we talked about the tomatoes in the, yes. in the greenhouse, then this will be my tomato spot this year. Okay. Okay. So in another week, we will uh, pull that greenhouse up on that rail to this location. Okay. So I have three locations <coughs> that I can grow. I mentioned that before and I know it was confusing, but what we can do is that we can grow our tomatoes year one here, year three will be back down at the lower end, year two, year three. So we rotate, rotate. those tomatoes okay. every, every uh, they don't grow on the same ground, one every three years. And is this dream house only for tomatoes? Uh, tomatoes, all the things we talked about that we like, we, we grow our eggplant in there, we grow those uh, sweet potatoes in there, okay. we grow our peppers in there. Okay. okay. So that's uh, the real heat loving ones and the ones we're trying to protect from blight. <laughs> well behind you Mary is the, uh, the, the portable greenhouse we talked about yeah. and what you see now that's dead on the top of the ground, okay. I planted that in the fall which was oats. And the reason I planted that is that it protects the soil over the winter. So if we have a lot of rain in the fall, which you mentioned before, we seem to get that worse and worse every fall. But what that does is it protects my soil. And in the spring, I haven't got to worry about huge amounts of runoff because it almost leaves a carpet over the top of the soil. And did you actually get pr produce oats that you were able to use? Uh, no, you just leave it as a green manure crop. So okay. all we did was let it come up late yes. in the fall yes. and I got a good catch and it was up to about my knees Whoa. before it, uh, the, before the frost started to knock it down a bit. Okay. So over the winter, the frost killed it yes. and laid it down just like that blanket there. Just, right. like, just like you laying a blanket over the soil. And that's what protects my soil from being, because we're on a slope. Yes. And I would just get it to run off down into the brook if it, I didn't do that. That's right. Okay. And, and with the one over there, which I just said is winter wheat, it is growing now and it's obviously protecting the soil because that's where I grew my garlic last year. Okay. So that bed is being protected and it has a, because it has a big mass of roots in it because it's now growing for the this season. Uh, tell me about these mats here. The uh... They're a weed mitigation strategy. That <laughs> I understand, you know, you can use lots of different things and people don't want those in the yard, <laughs> but it is a weed control measure so that I don't have to, if you were in a commercial operation, they'd spray, but we don't oh. spray. So you have okay. to come up with other ways to control weeds. Yep. And one of the easiest ways is to mat 
and people mat with all kinds of materials. They use old carpets and they use newspaper, yeah. they use cardboard. Ah, very interesting because I've used old doormats, rubber Perfect. doormats right. uh, for uh, weed killing in certain areas. Right. I see something just over here in the background, that wire fence or cage or little little mini house. What's that about, Peter? Well, that's the issue you you know well. That's the deer issue. Because uh. <laughs> we cannot grow anything on this property if we do not protect it from the deer. Okay. So, as I mentioned, one of the times we were walking somewhere, I said to you that I have six different fence systems, electric fence systems, that I have to run all the time during growing season. Uh. Or the deer would simply eat everything I've got. So, that is a system which protects my parsnips that I grew last year, yes. that we harvest in the spring now. Okay. We're eating them now, that's the last. I had a whole row of them, and that's the last little few parsnips that I'll go and dig. And, and, and that's then their little cage to keep them. Little cage to keep the deer okay. out, right. All right. We didn't do it one year, and I said, oh, they're not gonna bother the parsnips. They ate every single parsnip, and they dug them out of the ground. So help me, it's like you had a shovel, they dug them out of the ground. I oh, thought man. all the deer lived in St. Andrews. No, trust me, it's a county issue. Okay, all <laughs> yeah, right. That's a county issue, for all sure. Right. Shall we have a walk down to the dream house and I can show you what we're doing in our coal frame. Okay, the big dream greenhouse. Yes, yes, <laughs> go on, yeah. Okay, sounds good. We're in tropical paradise. <laughs> <laughs> a little different than there. Even that, you know. Are you I'll, sure we're in St. Stephen? Yeah, just like uh, outside it was cool. And my, uh, my feet were cold when we were talking yes, outside, but definitely. see inside it's totally different, isn't it? it? This is balmy, absolutely balmy. And this is not technically a greenhouse. This is technically a coal frame. Okay. A, a greenhouse for the most part would be, uh, would be able to keep temperature constant uh, for a longer periods of time. We have no heat in this. Okay. We have no electricity in here. It's simply a cover which protects the crop and gives me warming temperatures if the sun's out. Uh, but doesn't protect me much if it's really cold. Because right. I only get three or four degrees protection. Like if it's, uh, I'm on the old scale. What are you, do you use Celsius? No, not if I don't have to. <laughs> um, okay, but you've got tons of crops already growing in here. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did so, that from the, by using, to start some of that stuff. Like I told you when we talked to the kitchen garden, the lettuces will grow cold. Okay. And you so, can, same with the brassicas. Yeah. I've got all my broccoli, broccoli. cauliflower, cabbage, and uh, kale. All right. So those are in that row, and we'll be eating those in two weeks, right? And when did you put them in? They would have been, uh, that's there on their third week. Third week. And third look week. at the size of them. That's yeah, fabulous. It's coming, eh? Yeah. And then what you've got here is the radish crop. Yes. And uh, we grow dill. Um, beets and carrots and mainly design things that we're not keeping because we want to use this ground an another year because we move the greenhouse right okay yes because you're going to slide this whole house forward uh, to, to grow the tomatoes okay and i know that there's a lot of these tubes hanging around your head and stuff but as you can see what we when we grow early in the season we water with these stand waterers Okay. Okay, because what you can see the ground drying out there. Now yes. it hasn't dried out because the first two week, the last two weeks of April and the first part of May, it's been raining almost every day. So the ground is has not dried out, but it doesn't take long. See how the ground starts to dry there, especially already? in this temperature. Yeah. So yeah. we have to have a system to water this. Okay. And that's what this. This is a sprinkler system, and it'll water. And I don't care whether the leaves get wet for these crops. All right. But I couldn't have this system for my tomatoes. Tomatoes. Okay. Because I would just keep the tomato plant wet and it would just promote uh, the blight that everybody has in the, in the county. Okay. So we would change. When we move our house up, we drop this watering system to the ground and we plug those in each tomato plant. All right. And when I turn the water on, the water just goes into the soil by the tomato plant. Okay. Now, if in home situations, is there a preferred time for people to water their plants? Some people say water at night, some people say water in the morning. What's, what's the best rule of thumb? My wife is the expert on watering. She never liked to water at night. The same argument when we ran the greenhouse across the way is that you left water on your plants overnight. Okay. It, didn't you know, it didn't dry off. So she was very keen on you water in the morning. 
just because you don't want to have all that moisture sitting on the plant overnight, especially if it's a warm night or something, because right. you're just creating a, a, an environment for And disease. better to water down at the soil and the, the plant level rather than just spraying, hosing all over the top. You want the, it's the soil that you want to have the moisture in. Exactly, the, the issue there is that if you're spraying like we're spraying here, that's different because it's a contained environment. Yes. It's not going, it's not evaporating. It's, if it's evaporating, it's doing what it's doing on us. It's dripping on us, right? right. So the moisture stays here. But if you did that outdoors, mm -hmm. you would just be wasting water because you're spraying that water in the air. Most of it's just going, not on the plant. That's right. It's being evaporated. And when it's going on the plant, it's going on the leaves where you don't want it. You want your soil to be moist. That's that the you're idea. You're trying to feed the roots. Yeah. Okay. If you're growing, especially those ones we just talked about that are subject to disease, if you're growing to peppers and tomatoes, you want to get that water in the soil. So to go and spray them with a hose is really a, not a good thing to do. Counterproductive. Counterproductive. Totally. You really should be, and they have all these systems. They're not, they're, they're not expensive. You just put a, a, a pipe down and you punch the little thing in and you drip the hose, uh, you know, the water drips out. You don't even have to, you just turn the hose on and you're watering your plants. You hmm. And yes. it goes right to where you want it in the roots. Okay. Right. Yeah. So well, we talked before because the next, la when we move this greenhouse up to the next one where that we put the cover crop last fall, Yes. we have to make beds. And that's what we talked about making beds. So we will make beds the same way. There's one, two, three, four beds. All right. All right. So we will do the same thing when we move the greenhouse up to that next spot for our tomatoes or peppers and, and uh, eggplant and those hot growing things. We will make four beds in there. And so a lot of those oat leaves and stems, they can just be part of your walkway and just continually breaking down into your soil. Perfect. That's what you want. Okay. And th th this one now, we have that, that same mat system here. Right. And it it's two purposes. One of a, it'll keep the weed down in the middle, as we said before. But the second thing is, is this is an early house. We could be in here in April, and the ground is still semi-frozen, and you just it's just mucky. Okay. So this mat lets us walk up and down without All right. without just destroying the soil structure. Okay. So that's why we have the mats in here. They two purposes. They keep the weeds down, but they let us uh, access this house early. Is it a concern that you're going to pack the soil down too, too hard on your walkways? Or will your walkways be consistently in the same location so it's not a pressing issue? That's the, the our walkways will always be in this position. Okay. Always be, because we, we, when we move the greenhouse, that's what we have to move them up between the walkways. Okay. So yes, the, our four things are always in the way. Did you notice the yellow cards? Yes. Okay. Now. I know someone else mentioned that uh, they have a very difficult time growing uh, brassicas and radish and anything because they have the little leaf hoppers that eat the leaves. Up. Okay, I was going to say, is this a mosquito trap? Or? That's what it is. <laughs> oh. It is basically. You can order them on Amazon. They're just yellow sticky traps. Okay. If you stick them in your garden for your beet greens and your uh, brassicas, you can see my brassicas are clean still. Yes. That's because I have those yellow sticky cards. And the, the okay. black flies will go to the yellow sticky part and stick on them. Okay. And it kills them and they stay off my plants. And it works pretty good, really. And now could you use something like this in an, an outdoor garden without protection? Or I, would you run into problems with birds or other? No, it, it's, it works fine there. Now what I do when I put my cloche, if I'm planting outdoors, I just, with the system we're going to talk about, we have those wires in the ground and you see the wires next yep, there? Yep, so I have those wire wires hoops. and then I pull a plastic blanket over the top of those. That's called a cloche, right? Okay. And I started those under a cloche. Yeah. Can't keep them because it, they get too hot. And if you look down, I don't know if we can see at the end of the greenhouse, there's a piece of cloche that I will be oh, putting yeah, the over green my potatoes fiber, here. Yeah. Okay. So when you're, when you're doing that, uh, you're, you're retaining the heat inside the soil doubly. I got heat from my plastic cold frame, but then I got another insulation layer because I've got a cloche over my plants All on right. the inside. And that's why these plants are a foot tall. That's right. And, and so I will put those in. outside. I put that cloche outside too. When I put my okay. when I put my brassicas outside in the main garden, yes. my winter uh, uh, cabbage and my winter uh, broccoli, I'll put that cloche over, over and I'll put these cards underneath it. 
Okay, okay. Okay. And that, okay, because I was going to say it's risky for butterflies or bees. You don't want them to be No, you trapped. don't want them in, but they, no. they, my crop will be covered. Okay. And, and if you can get them through that stage till they get to be that size, yes. then the, the beetle doesn't do as much damage anyway. Oh. So you really want them when their leaves are tiny. Tiny, okay. Because they can just destroy the, the uh, yep. beet crop in particular. Yeah. They'll just eat the leaves down to nothing. Oh dear. Okay. So that's a good protection. Now someone else said, well, I saw the white cloth on, right? Yes. Well, we use the same system outside to keep the bugs off uh, by putting those metal hoops in the ground. Yes. And putting the white cloth over the top. Okay, and do you leave the white cloth on overnight as well? You leave it on the whole season. The whole season. Yeah, okay. and that way, uh, the you know the the one that does most damage to the worm in your in your broccoli, yeah. the green worm yes. that everybody hates in their broccoli. Well, if you have your broccoli covered with a white cloth, it won't. It won't. They can't because the butterfly can't get in. And, and does eggs. the moisture get through the white yes, fabric? Yes, it'll okay. rain right through it. Okay, it'll All right. rain right through it, and the sun goes through it. Okay. So potato beetles are the same way. If you cover your potato crop with that white cloth, yes, then you the potato beetle, for the most part, they fly in. Now I know there's a an indigenous population that live in the soil, and mm -hmm. they will come up through. Okay. But if you take your cloth off uh, once a week or something and just go pick your things off, you'll be a uh, you can beat the potato beetle the same All way. Right. That uh, that means you don't have to put poisons or anything on your crop. You know, yeah, which, yeah, it's important to avoid that totally. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm eating this, and my grandkids are eating this, and yeah. that's why we're doing it. We're yeah. doing it so we know what's on it, and we don't have to dump a whole lot of stuff or chemicals. And even if it does have one or two worms, we're okay with that for the most part. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pick them off. Pick them off. That's right. All right. That's the uh, spinach we planted last year. Someone said. You know, what's the best time to make your beds? Should you make them in the fall? Ideally, I'd make all my beds in the fall, especially in our climate, because now we get so much rain in the spring, okay. and you can't get on your garden. Right. If you had your beds made, it would be ideal. All but right. we can't do that in some, like uh, I can't do that if I have my, uh, I let leaves my, my soil exposed. So if I had all my beds made, my soil would be exposed, and if it rained, heavy rains, which we've had, would just wash all that soil away. Okay. So yes, there's arguments on both sides. Ideally, I make a few beds in the fall and I try to protect them, uh, or I cover them with a cover crop and then, uh, and, you know, have to do the rest of my gardening in the spring when I can get on the ground. Okay. Just so have to wait. essentially you've had, you've had spinach, fresh spinach, fresh spinach all winter? It, uh, it won't grow in the dead of winter but it'll grow in the fall. So we plant it late in the fall. We get a crop in the fall. We eat off it in the fall. It slows down and goes dormant through the winter. And now it springs back up. Now, it, you notice, if you notice down there, uh, there are a lot of new plants coming in between. Yes. So we plant new spinach okay. in there too. But that is the fourth cutting of that spinach. Whoa. We've cut it four times. And that's why people it's can't grow spinach because they grow it in the summer. And it okay. won't grow in the summer. It just gets too hot and it bolts. All You're right. going to grow spinach, yep. grow it late in the fall or early in the spring. Okay. And don't bother trying to grow spinach in the summer. In the, in the heat of the summer, okay. It's the same thing we talked about with the lettuce, right? It's, yep. it's, unless you're going to grow it in the shade, it's hardly worth the growing. Yeah. It just gets bitter and, and yep. it doesn't go well in the sun. Yeah. No, and I've had spinach bolt before too. Exactly. That's what the bolting is the thing. It just goes to seed real quick. Yep. Yeah. And that just says, oh, I'm finished growing. Too bad. I'm uh, this is a bit off topic, but mm. rhubarb. I've had rhubarb bolt yeah. a few years in a row. D have you ever divided the root? Oh, we'll do that another time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean my 25-year-old plant needs yes, dividing? Yes. It, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's usually a sign that it's saying, oh, for God's sakes, do something with me. And if, it's, if you're getting seed heads for forming on your rhubarb, yes. it's because your roots need to be split. Uh, and do it in the fall. It's kay. better to do it in the fall. You can do it in the spring, but it's better to do it in the fall. And you can't do it wrong, first of all. Okay. You can't do it wrong. All right. You dig up the root that's there. Yes. Take an old axe yep. and whack it in four. Okay. And put two of the pieces back in your garden and give two away. All right. And then you're... you're and can it go back in the same location, General, yeah, uh, or do you yeah, want to move that? No, I th I've seen rhubarb, but I know that we talked about not growing in the same, you know. For and certain we're plants, lucky yep, here yep. because we have the land base to move our crops around. Yeah. And I think it's really important that people try to do that. 
You can't grow turnip in the same ground year after year. You're just going to get into a mess. Yeah. You, it's the same thing. You can't grow any of those crops in the same row year after year. You've got to try to move that yep. so that you, you know, you have Because they're sucking it. certain nutrients out of the soil all the time. Exactly. So you've got And they also leave certain imprints in that soil, which are uh, certain diseases which only attack that plant. Okay. So the longer you put them in there, yep. and peas are an example. You put peas in the same ground year after year after year, and you're going to get pea yellows in that ground, and then you have a very difficult time trying to get rid of it. Okay. So keep things on the move. Yeah. Pansies are the same way. Okay. Yeah, people grow pansies in the same ground year after year. Remember the pansy patch? Yep. They, we used to pr provide them with pansies, but they got to the point where they couldn't put pansies because they were using the same soil. Oh. And so it was the same issue. They just yeah. couldn't grow them. You yeah. Know? So I was toxic to the pansy. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. excellent. Well, thank you so much. Oh, we have pleasure. written a few books here today, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you asked some questions, yeah. Yeah. That's all good. And that's the main thing is I think that if we tell anything to a gardener, as they say, listen, do it. Who cares whether it works or it doesn't? The bonus is you get something to eat out of it, right? But yeah. It's wonderful for kids to see growing. It's a great place to relax and, you know, and to spend some time by yourself and to watch what nature can do. Yeah. And not everything works. Every year I have failures. There's just a qu no question. Every year. Yeah. And I can show you one when I go to the garlic crop. I'm going to okay. show you a failure. Oh, yes, because we want to see that garlic. We want to see the garlic, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do that next, and we'll stop over and look at the garlic. Thank you for joining us today at Gore Farm, and we're going to come back again because there's so much more to see. Thank you, Peter.